What's big in the Big Apple? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2006. TSN's Motoring 2006 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. This week we're in the Big Apple, New York City. 22 million people live in metropolitan New York. 8 million alone right here in Manhattan. Now we're here in New York this week, among other things, to check out the New York Auto Show. We're also going to welcome a new sponsor, Michelin, to the motoring family. We'll tell you more about that later. But first, as we all know, Toyota is very quickly getting ready to overtake General Motors as the world's number one automaker. But a lot of young people, they call them Generation Y, still think a lot of Toyotas look the same. Now the company, of course, is trying to change that image, and this week, we're going to check out a vehicle that Toyota thinks will not only appeal to young people, but they also believe will take another big bite out of the domestic market. Tacoma has been an enormous success for us. Uh, it was all built around uh, the never quit truck strategy, which talked about Toyota as, as the true global truck brand and the, and the vehicle that you'd find long after the road ran out. Um, but we knew that there was a hardcore of uh, Toyota fans out there who had been driving Land Cruisers and uh, you know, wanted to see us get back into a true off-road vehicle. The FJ Cruiser was a styling exercise at first. It was a concept vehicle for the auto shows, uh, but the response was so immediate and dramatic that we knew we had to bring this one to market. I think it's time Toyota put some style into its sport utility vehicles. I mean, they've had a lot of very bland, dull-looking trucks in a segment that's increasingly defined by, well, you've got to look at General Motors' Hummer division, which really goes after that bold look. So by reaching a bit into their history and putting some pizzazz into the styling, uh, the, the vehicle offers something that they don't have anywhere else in a Toyota showroom. The FJ Cruiser is an uh, SUV that's uh, biased towards off-road performance. It's built on a leather frame, a fully box frame with seven cross members. It's got independent front suspension, it's got rear salt axle. It comes with one engine, which is a 4-liter V6, and puts out 239 horsepower and 278 pound-feet of torque. And in the cargo area, the uh, rear door swings open away from the curb. The styling ties in uh, very closely to the original FJ40 series from the uh, 1960s. And you can see that the front where you have the circular headlamps and the upright windshield, the uh, white roof line, the uh, wraparound uh, rear windows on the three-quarter panels. So that ties in uh, very closely to the original FJ40. It's a true off-road vehicle. It's got big knobby tires. It's very noisy on the highway. Uh, there's a lot of wandering, uh, you know, at higher speeds uh, simply because of the, you know you've got a very high center of gravity vehicle with very aggressive off-road tires. So if you are looking for an urban adventure vehicle, this is probably the wrong vehicle. If you want to make a styling statement, uh, if you're a skier, or a cottage goer, um, this is a kind of vehicle that will grab a lot of attention. So really, for the buyer of an FJ, really needs to think about: Am I looking for making a statement, or am I looking for true urban comfort? This vehicle, we have, we're very excited about it. It's, it's going to bring back the toughness, back to Toyota image in terms of uh, roadworthiness. This is just another one of our trucks that never quits. Now the pricing's right. It actually starts for under thirty thousand dollars. You get the base package, six-speed manual transmission, and uh, you can get a fully loaded FJ Cruiser for under forty thousand dollars. We're still left with the fact that nobody, or virtually nobody, ever takes these trucks off-road. So it is a styling um, activity, but not unlike people who buy Porsches and will never do 250 kilometers an hour either. We now have about 15% of the market on the car side, but for the last year or so we've been down about the 5% share of the, uh, of the truck marketplace. So if, if we're going to grow, the opportunity is with, with trucks. 
but the only place you're going to see the name Chrysler in this town is on the Chrysler Building. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Where some manufacturers have abandoned the automobile and become more like truck companies, Daimler Chrysler has concentrated on the car. First came Crossfire, 300C and then Charger. This week on Test Drive, the all-new Calibre. Where Dodge succeeds and many fail is in the styling department. While the Calibre is very much focused on function and utility, its aggressive form stands out from a very bland crowd. With a front grille and fenders that wouldn't be out of place on the Dodge Ram, it is expressive without being overbearing. Indeed, the reaction to the SXT tested was universal. Two thumbs up from all who stopped by to admire the car. You know, this Calibre has been very nicely finished off inside. To begin with, quality plastics, nice two-tone grey finish. The splash of colour in the seats and on the dash really brightens things up. As for the controls, well, they're all logically placed and putting the radio where it belongs in the place of prominence is the way it should be. Also, white face dials, very easy to pick up the information with a quick scan of your eyes. The other thing I really do like, 115 volt outlet in the centre console. More cars should have one. As for the drawbacks, well, there's two. First of all, the cab forward styling means this acreage of dashboard ahead of you effectively means you cannot see the nose of the car. As for the other problem, these A pillars are very large. So if something's coming at you at about a 35 degree angle or a 45 degree angle, you've got to be very careful because they hide behind those large A pillars. Power for the Caliber comes from one of three four-cylinder engines. The base 148 horsepower 1.8 litre, the tester's 158 horsepower 2 litre, and the range topping 2.4 and its 172 horsepower. All these engines feature variable valve timing and deliver reasonable punch off the line. The 2 litre in the SXT tested also featured the optional continuously variable transmission. This thing works a little differently. Rather than forcing the engine to rev up between each shift, as is the case with a normal transmission, the CVT works for the engine. When you pull away under moderate throttle, the engine revs up to around 3000 RPM and stays there as the transmission continuously changes its infinitely variable ratios to build speed. When needed, there is a manual mode which gives the driver six predetermined speeds to choose from. You know, given the exterior dimensions of this caliber, there's a ton of room in the back seat and it boils down to clever design. They've lifted the seats well off the floor so you've got plenty of toe room. The back of the seat's sculpted out so you've got lots of knee room and obviously plenty of headroom. There is, however, a problem and it boils down to the fact that Chrysler cheaped out on the liners they put in the inner fenders. Every time you drive through a puddle, well, it sounds like somebody having a pee on a tin roof. It boils down to the fact that because it's only a partial liner, the water hits the body and makes a terribly tinny noise. The other noise problem has to do with the CVT. Matt the gas and the engine revs up to 6,000 or so RPM and it stays there until the driver lifts. On a long on-ramp, the engine's noise tends to get a tad tedious. The good news is that by using the CVT rather than a conventional four-speed automatic, the Calibre actually consumes up to 8% less gas, which with current prices more than compensates for the noise under hard acceleration. The brakes are another source of good news. During the brake test, the anti-lock system managed to haul the car to rest from 100k in just 38.1 meters. Whoa, baby. As with the rest of the car, the back end of this Calibre has been very well thought through. Much needed wash wiper and when you pop the tailgate, well you'll find plenty of cargo space, hard plastic on the floor so you can wipe it out after you've had a dirty load in there, privacy cover to keep prying eyes off your valuables and when you fold the seats down you more than double the cargo capacity. The thing I really do like though, if you go with the optional Boston acoustic sound system, you not only get a very large and loud subwoofer, you also get these drop down rear speakers. Anyone for a tailgate party? 
When it comes to handling the pylon test, there are no complaints. The front strut and multi-link rear suspensions are helped enormously by anti-roll bars at both ends and large 215-60R17 tyres. When pushed, body roll is limited, understeer is benign and the reaction to steering input is commendably quick without feeling twitchy. Few front drive cars are as well balanced when you start to flirt with the limits. You know, in spite of my criticisms, this new calibre is a decent package that's great value for money. The reason? Very simple. The sum of its attributes vastly exceeds its asking price. It's time to introduce the new members to our long-term garage and all are motoring award winners. Although the Honda Civic won our overall car of the year, the new and improved Hyundai Sonata was a close second. The Sonata not only offers a ton of standard equipment, but it has a refinement not seen in earlier models. Speaking of companies that continue to improve their product, the new Suzuki Gran Vitara is better looking and more powerful than its predecessor, and it's now based on a new unibody platform. And finally, Bill Gardner will be climbing into the most talked about Honda product in years. The Ridgeline is the company's first pickup truck. Now all these vehicles impress us to win their categories, but we'll now see how they respond to the rigors of everyday driving. New York is a bit like schools out, you know, it's the end of term, it's before Easter, sunshine in New York, the, the daffodils are blooming or whatever, so people actually enjoy coming here, there's a great relaxed mood, and where it's been a bit slow in the past few years, this year, there's a tremendous amount of new products, I mean we're standing next to the Bentley stand, where they've just done the global reveal of the new GTC Continental convertible, you know, a convertible in New York in springtime, what better car is that? So it's a great show, I mean there's a lot of friendly energy here I think this year. I think the New York media is very skeptical, so automakers basically bring vehicles here that they feel very solid about. They know they're going to get some piercing questions. It's not just a hometown press like in Detroit or a press that may favor import brands, say in L.A. It's a press that says, you know, this is New York. It's not a real car-friendly city. We want to know the straight poop, so you better be able to uh, dish it out if you're going to come here to the Big Apple. I don't know. I've been coming here a long time. It's my favorite show. Today here in New York, we're proud to show the world premiere of our all-new mid-size sport utility vehicle, which is the XL7. This is a crossover, seven-seater, available in all-wheel drive or front-wheel drive, uh, fully loaded, navigation pack, disc players for the family when they're on the trips, uh, built at our Cami plant in Ingersoll, Ontario, exclusive for the market in Canada and the United States. Uh, it features a Japanese-built 3.6-liter V6 engine, 250 horsepower, and we see that targeting in to the midsize segment as a crossover utility vehicle, more the Pacifica Freestyle era category than would be, say, a Pilot or a Highlander. I've been at Suzuki now since 1991, so just into my 16th year. Uh, at that time, we were a fairly small player in the North American market with compact uh, sport utilities and compact cars. In the past year and a half, the company in Japan, our main factory, has decided that achieving 2 million units worldwide production without North America has now changed their focus to come to this market. So you're going to see from Suzuki over the next two or three years, which is very exciting, two or three new models being introduced every year so we can expand our lineup, expand our dealer body, and enhance our image in the country. 
You know, as I've mentioned in the past, sponsorship means everything to a program like ours. Believe me, if it wasn't for companies like Quaker State, we wouldn't have been on the air for the past 19 years. Well, this week, we're delighted to announce a new sponsor to our motoring family. It's a company that many believe manufactures the best tire in the world. That company is Michelin, and they're going to be bringing us a segment called The Better Way Forward. Well, this week, we're going to take a closer look at a company that is dedicated not only to producing the safest tire for your vehicle, but also finding for all of us a better way forward. Typically we're recognized as a world leader in terms of a tire manufacturer, in terms of uh, quality, uh, reliability, performance of our products, but internally we've got uh, some bigger ambitions than just being a tire manufacturer. You know, we perceive ourselves more so as a provider of mobility solutions for the transport of uh, people and goods from one point to another point. When we strive to, to, to produce different products, we always aim to, uh, to produce these products with very little rolling resistance built into them. Low rolling resistance uh, equates into lower CO2 emissions on a global level. Uh, it also equates to a lower consumption of fuel on a global level. That's really our contribution from an environmental uh, perspective. We provide many services beyond just tires. Uh, one of our divisions is dedicated to the production of very high quality maps and guides in the marketplace. Uh, these are recognized throughout the world uh, for their integrity and the great information they provide to consumers as they go about with their travels. We're just not in it in terms of just selling tires. Anybody can just sell tires. We've got a social responsibility in terms of delivering those products to the marketplace. And that's why we're part of Mordering, and, and that's, uh, that's essentially why we're, we're trying to uh, convey some of these messages to consumers out there in Canada. Earlier we checked out Toyota's FJ Cruiser, a vehicle the company's hoping will attract not only young people, but also the trucking crowd. Well, as we all know, the truck guy on motoring is our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. And I'm wondering what Bill thinks of what is really an unusually bold statement for Toyota. Brad, I don't mind the look of the FJ Cruiser, but you know, how long have you known me? 17, 18 years? You know, if it doesn't have a cargo box and a tailgate, if it's not a pickup truck, I don't want to hear about it because you never know when you have to pick up really big cargo. Well, this tire would probably be a little bit too big for even a pickup truck, but most cargo that we deal with will fit in a full-size pickup truck, something like this space shuttle tire right here. We've just spent the whole day out here at the Michelin Lawrence Proving Grounds in, in South Carolina, and we had a lot of fun here today, learned a lot of things about car control, the effects of underinflated tires, the effects of replacing only two tires on a car, and possibly creating some handling difficulties for yourself with two new tires versus two old tires. One thing that I really did learn here today as well is the fact that I think most people need to get some kind of advanced driver training. They need to have a chance to experience a car getting a little bit out of shape, the tail end starting to swing out, how to regain control, and you know, not panicking when these things happen. Sooner or later, you're gonna experience these, these things. If they catch you by surprise and you just panic, you may make the wrong move and it could be very costly. So getting advanced driver training is very important. And if you can't afford to get advanced driver training, you at least need to get out there on that deserted parking lot in the first couple of snowfalls of the season and experience that car getting a little bit out of shape. You wanna find out about anti-lock brakes nail the brakes really hard so the ABS cuts in, get to know what it sounds like, what it feels like so it doesn't scare you when it happens, and just feel car control. Feel the car getting a little bit out of shape and try some steering input and getting the car back under control because sooner or later it's gonna happen, you don't want it to catch you by surprise. This is one very specialized tire right here. Came off NASA's space shuttle right after a landing in 1998. Definitely never thought I'd see that on the tailgate of my pickup truck. It was all two of us could do to lift that baby up in there. That is one mighty Husky tire. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2006.
you can probably guess, we're in the Big Apple. Yes, the city's so nice, they named it twice, New York, New York, where the biggest threat to your health is probably not mugging, it's sunburn on the roof of your mouth from doing one of these. But you know, they got everything in this town, a Starbucks in every corner. We even saw a guy selling women's shoes right off the sidewalk. They also have an auto show here in New York, and on first glance, that seems like kind of an odd thing. I mean, who owns a car in New York? 75% of Manhattan residents don't even own a car. Who is this auto show talking to? People get around here by subway, by bus, by limo, or by taxi. That's right, most New Yorkers think that all cars are yellow and have a light on the roof. Now, most of those 12,000 cabs are Canadian-built Ford Crown Victorias, but we're starting to see a lot of those Toyota, Sienna minivans. That's another area where the Japanese are sneaking into those domestic markets. And the medallions, the license for those cabs, quarter of a million dollars. It's a crazy business, but getting back to that auto show, there actually are a couple of reasons why they have an auto show here. First of all, it's the last major auto show of the season. We've already had Los Angeles and Detroit and Geneva. This is the last chance the car companies have to make an impression on the consumer. Also, it's the beginning of the spring season. This is when people actually buy cars, so the purchase of a car is fresh in their minds. Most important though, New York might not be the car capital of the world, but it is the cultural and financial capital of the world. Most importantly, it's the media center of the world. If the car companies can get their message on those TV networks that are headquartered here, or in the New York Times, or of course on motoring, they've got it made. But you know, the traffic here is completely insane. These cabbies all drive like kamikaze pilots on commission. And the one place I don't want to be in New York City, it's in a car. I'm Jim Kenzie. One of the most famous thoroughfares in Manhattan is Broadway. And did you know that Broadway is one of the longest urban streets in the world? It begins at the southern tip of Manhattan and continues north, about 150 miles or about 241 clicks to Albany, New York. But what street holds the distinction of being the world's longest? It's Young Street in Toronto. 1,178 miles or just under 2,000 kilometers. So how about that? Anyway, it's time to leave what I consider to be the most incredible, most exciting city in the world, New York. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Any city where you have large population, real estate is expensive, people don't have room for their toys. And that's where this service comes into play. TSN's Motoring 2006 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward.